It is my pleasure to invite to the stage uh, participants in the last panel focusing on what people have been talking about, which is how do we collaborate basic sciences from around the globe? How can we strengthen our collaborations? The first uh, panelist is Ursula Basler, Dr. Ursula Basler, who is research director at, uh, and former president of CERN. The second is from Jordan, Dr. Khalid uh, Tukan. The third is uh, Dr. Dabulka, who is the director of Addis uh, Salama, Salam uh, International Center for Theoretical Physics. Uh, Dr. Tukan is from Sesame. And then we have online Dr. Mohamed Hassan, who is the president of World Academy of Sciences. And on video, Dr. Mike Stratton, director of Welcome Sanger Institute in the UK. So, I uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Ursula Basla. Yes, thank you very much. You asked in the beginning. Uh, what about realization of the sustainable development goals? And uh, I think from a perspective of particle physicists, it looks much more complicated than discovering the Higgs boson. So um, I think there are many political, social questions associated to it. And naturally, I hope also that research in humanities and social sciences will help in realizing uh, and, and overcoming these problems especially as uh, war pandemics really affected the realization of them. Uh, however, I mean, I'm very impressed also by all the effort and the intelligence that goes into the planning of realization of this Global Sustainable Goals, uh, the monitoring of uh, the evolution uh, of the goals. And I think this is a method that we also use in our disciplines, actually. Now, what can basic science, particle physics, bring to the social, this uh, sustainable development goals? Um, naturally, we are missioned at CERN for looking into the fundamental laws of the universe. However, sustainable development goals are very important to us. And what we can contribute is maybe already our existence, reuniting people from all over the world in order to solve a complicated problem. Uh, bringing people from more than a hundred nations together with a common goal, subscribing to common values. And I think this is, has already been mentioned in the previous panel, but this is an important issue to share a common goal, to share common values. Uh, as was mentioned this morning by uh, uh, Rolf Heuer, Director General, uh, the Higgs boson was an emblematic discovery, uh, provoking a lot of interest from the general public. Now, the Higgs boson was 10 years ago. However, you should understand that LHC produced more than 3,000 scientific publications, generating more than 10,000 publications that reference these scientific results. In order to make this uh, this results known, CERN was a precursor for open science publication. With the Scope 3 initiative, uh, about more than 50,000 publications are globally, openly available now and stimulating scientific exchange with countries that have never been seen on this land, on the, on the map before. Dissemination, education, summer students are coming to CERN from more than 70 countries. This is completely important. Now, fundamental research is looking to disruptive results. Uh, there is the saying, you cannot, improve the ca the, you cannot invent electricity by improving the candle. 
at some point you have to invest in trying to increase the knowledge and then it may take decennies until the technologies come. However, without this research, they will never come. On the way there, we are developing applications that may already be important now. For our next projects, we know that we need to improve our energy efficiency, our environmental impact. CERN was one of the first research infrastructures that looked into its environmental impact and that is monitoring in order to try to efficiently reduce it. And I think this is an example that is also valid for other domains. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to hurry you, but uh, we're running out of time. Uh, Dr. Tukan, you are in an, an institution that really embodies collaboration. Can we have a few words from you? Uh, I would uh, talk about Sesame. Today we have heard this morning from Shamila, and also uh, we heard from Rolf Fire about a really a success story uh, of establishing an international research center in the Middle East that involved mainly collaboration from probably all continents around the globe. Uh, at the beginning, there was a lot of skepticism about Sesame because there were technological challenges to build a synchrotron really is an involved technological and scientific challenge in addition to political tensions in our region. As you know, since World War II, the Middle East has been uh, probably wrecked by continuous wars, revolutions, name it. And uh, there were also financial challenges when it came to supporting a very advanced scientific research center with limited budgets in the region. However, I should say that we succeeded, and this couldn't have been made possible had it not been for international collaboration in science. Where different countries in the region, namely we had eight member states from the region, but more importantly, we had the support of the international scientific community and also international of major international organizations, namely UNESCO, where uh, UNESCO played a major role in establishing uh, SESAMI, uh, where we, these first statutes uh, for SESAMI built on the model of CERN were established and deposited at UNESCO. Uh, uh, the first meetings to really discuss SESAMI, some of it c uh, were held in this hall and some of it in other neighboring halls. International Atomic Energy Agency played a ma major role, European uh, Commission, also uh, uh, supported that, in addition to the international scientific community in Europe, United States, Japan. And today, actually, as Sesame is uh, becoming alive, uh, we are really producing a world-class science. Uh, we have a total of probably uh, 27 countries uh, with uh, uh, probably uh, 316 proposals being received, uh, uh, publications are coming out of SESAMI, and uh, currently we have three uh, uh, beamlines active. Uh, one has been commissioned recently, uh, the Softray X beamline, in, uh, su supported by the Helmholtz Foundation in Germany. Uh, another beamline is being built uh, by the uh, Turkish scientific community, and uh, 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 six beam line, which is an advanced tomography beam line, uh, is uh, being built and will be commissioned at the end of this year. Uh, Sesame has contributed. We are a user facility opening its doors to the international scientific community from the Middle East and all around, and we could see uh, the spectrum of research being done in line with uh, uh, supporting development goals when it comes to materials, new energy, climate change, st uh, stimulating STEM education. Uh, we have uh, experiments being done on the MOFs, metallic organic frameworks uh, for some advanced research in order to prepare new materials, materials for new electric batteries, uh, research done on health, 
pharmaceuticals, catalysis, and uh, by all accounts, cultural heritage and also archaeology. Uh, Sesame being uh, located in the Middle East, which is the cradle of human history, uh, we could see that uh, we have been very active in supporting uh, scientific uh, uh, research in archaeology and cultural heritage spanning a long history. For thousands of years, we have been uh, looking at ancient Egyptian mummies. We have looking, uh, been looking at bones and teeth uh, from the Roman era. Uh, also, uh, some manuscripts uh, from the modern uh, Middle East. Uh, so by all accounts, international collaboration is really pivotal when it comes to merging, emerging efforts in order to really achieve tangible science that will sustain uh, basically uh, the movement towards meeting SDGs and also overcoming political tensions, overcoming our region and also the globe at large. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very <coughs> encouraging model of we can if we want to collaborate. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Dublaka. Nabolka. Nabolka. How do they? Okay. Uh, please uh, okay. share your thoughts. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm a theoretical physicist by training. And I currently direct the uh, International Center for Theor raise your voice a bit. Uh, I currently direct the International Center for Theoretical Physics, which has a unique mission, which has a direct bearing on the year of uh, uh, so, uh, that we are celebrating today, the International Year for Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. And I think, in fact, it is even more urgent uh, now that we are entering a very critical moment in human history. Uh, for example, climate change and pandemics, we know that they do not respect uh, national boundaries. It requires a collective global response based on evidence-based uh, thinking and a way of approach. Uh, and that is where the importance of basic sciences cannot be uh, overemphasized. Uh, and that is where the mission of ICTP is really play has been playing a very important role because basic sciences have a dual role to play. One is to offer uh, tools and know-how, intellectual tools, to deal with problems like climate, uh, climate change, but also it offers a common language, as was emphasized also earlier, for international uh, cooperation and dialogue, because Newton's laws are the same in Paris or in Cairo. And that is what ICTP was founded on. This is the basic premise of uh, an international hub where scientists from all over the world can come together. ICTP welcomes, founded by the Nobel laureate uh, Abdus Salam, uh, it welcomes 6,000 scientists from all over the world every year. Uh, since its inception 60 years ago, uh, something like 200,000 scientists from essentially 180 countries have been to ICTP. Half of them are from the developing countries, fully funded by ICTP. 30% of them are women. And the goal is to bring the young, inspiring, uh, young aspiring uh, graduate students from all over the world in contact with the best researchers, including Nobel laureates, uh, in a way combining excellence with inclusion because ICTP's research has contributed to many major advances in science, including uh, Nobel Prizes, but it really brings uh, them in contact with the uh, scientists in the developing world. And that, I think, is a unique mission because it sort of helps to overcome the barriers of geography and economics and gender and ethnicity, which is what we were talking about, the inequality. And ICTP has been playing that role very much, very importantly, and for that reason, organi international organizations like ICTP CERN, or UNESCO have a major role to play. I will just quickly say that um, th there was a point about open science and open education, and ICTP basically has been doing it. But as was emphasized by Professor Arosh, uh, this is really requires a long-term investment. It's not something that you can do in five years' time. 
Uh, I think there is a very nice story about Euclid telling the Emperor Ptolemy that there is no royal road to geometry. You cannot learn geometry in two days. And I think one can say the same, the scientific community can tell the policymakers that there is no royal road to advanced technology. Thank you. you. And that is where the uh, uh, organizations like ICTP can continue to play an important role. Thank you so much. Uh, we now turn to our colleagues who are online. First, uh, Dr. Mohamed Hassan, who is uh, someone we looked up to in my younger days of the World uh, Academy of Sciences. Dr. Mohamed? Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes. Do you hear me? I hear you. Yes. I hope because the, the line is, is um, very bad. Uh, but I will, um, I will try, I will raise my voice. Um, I, I would like really to confine my short comments uh, to the challenges in basic sciences in uh, science and technology lagging countries. And these are 66 countries identified by TWAS that lag behind the rest of the world in science and technology capacity, especially in research and education in basic sciences. And most of these countries are in Africa and they include all the 48 least developed countries. There are very few well-qualified researchers in basic sciences compared to applied sciences in these countries. And they get very little funding from their national institutions and governments, as well as international funding agencies to support their research. Uh, in addition, there are very few international centers or programs that support basic sciences in these countries. The ones I am familiar with are the ICTP, which has just been mentioned by its director, the International Science Program of, in Uppsala, Sweden, and TWAS. And I wish to briefly highlight two uh, TWAS programs that support basic scientists working and living in these six, six countries. First, the training of the next generation of highly qualified basic scientists through South-South collaboration. TWAS, I am happy to say, has the largest South-South postgraduate and postdoctoral fellowship program in basic sciences in the world. The fellowships are offered only to students and young researchers in the 66 countries and are tenable at competent research universities in the 66 countries that, are, that I have just mentioned. They have competent research universities and centers of excellence, including countries like China, India, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, and others. Uh, the hosting countries cover all the local expenses. Over 350 fellowships are offered each year, costing the local hosts over $5 million annually. Over 900 PhD students graduated and published over 1,900 peer-reviewed papers, and nearly all of them returned home after graduation. Over 1,000 PhD students are currently on site. And the second, very briefly, is the, the TWAS uh, research grants program. Since 1986, TWAS has been providing competitive research grants in basic sciences, and that is up to $30,000 to young scientists and research groups in the 66 countries, mainly to purchase equipment and material they desperately need for their research. The program received generous support from CEDA the Swedish International Development Agency, and this is North-South Cooperation, essentially. To us, has so far awarded over 2,600 such grants. Now, the point, the important point I would like to make, uh, uh, Madam Chair, is that some of these grantees on TWAS, web, shown on TWAS website, successfully address sustainability issue. And I will just give one example, very short example. One such Dr. example Hassan, is a Nigerian we're running student. out of time. If you could uh, just, just conclude. one minute, possible? Yes. yes, I'm just mentioning this Nigerian student who obtained his PhD in chemistry from China under TWAS fellowship program, returned to Nigeria, and later on obtained a research grant from TWAS, which helped him to develop a low cost water purification material made of clay and papaya seeds. 
He obtained two patents for his discovery and is now working to scale it up, to scale the innovation up. Thank so this you. is an example I think should be highlighted with others. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, the final speaker is Dr. Mike Stratton from Welcome. Is online. Well, Thank you for inviting me to speak about aspects of genome science in relation to sustainable development. Large scale, globally collaborative projects have been a core feature of genome science since the sequencing of the 3,000 million letters of DNA code in the human genome in year 2000. First, initiatives in several countries are sequencing the genomes of hundreds of thousands to millions of people, collecting health information, lifestyle information, and various biological measurements from the same individuals. Second, there will be genome sequencing of cancers and normal tissues from around the world for mutations which are not inherited, but arise during our lifetimes. And these studies in order to understand the hidden environmental or lifestyle exposures accounting for the geographically widely differing rates of many cancer types. Third, a large scale project will transform understanding of the building blocks of human beings, cells. Our bodies are constructed from trillions of cells, each of which serves a particular function, for example, fat cells or muscle cells or nerve cells. Today, cells can be separated from each other and individually sequenced to work out which of the 20,000 genes in the human genome are being used in each one. In this way, a new and more refined human cell atlas will be constructed discovering all normal cell types and those present in the range of human diseases. Fourth, there will be international initiatives in sequencing the genomes of infectious disease causing microorganisms. During the coronavirus pandemic, more than 10 million COVID-19 viruses were sequenced, making it by far the most extensively sequenced organism on earth. Many other infectious diseases continue to evolve and spread. Malaria causes the death of 500,000 children every year, and sequencing large numbers of malaria parasites and the mosquitoes transmitting them will provide public health agencies with early warning of emerging drug resistance, thus enabling changes in treatment strategies. These initiatives will also improve our preparedness for the next pandemic. And fifth, the world is now embarking on sequencing all species. There are about 2 million known, ranging from single cell organisms that are invisible to us to the grand and familiar, such as elephants and oak trees. Homo sapiens has become custodian of life on Earth. Sequencing the genomes of all species will allow us to catalog and make inventory of life on Earth. It will enable monitoring of individual species and whole ecosystems changing over time, notably in the face of climate change, which we can harness to make Earth a more sustainable, supportive, and healthier place. For all these initiatives to achieve optimal impact, we will need to responsibly share the data generated for the whole world to use. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that this has been a bit hurried because we lost time during the day, but I think this last panel, if we still needed to be convinced, has uh, presented us with examples of when we are at our best is when we collaborate and that's when we are able to do much more to learn as we heard from the last speaker a lot more from nature and how living systems work and what they do is to collaborate and if we can learn to collaborate like our cell bodies are collaborating, then I think the world would be a better place. Thank you very much. And please help me thank our panelists.